to the Poker Deals podcast. Today, we bring you great fortune in the wisdom of a true poker veteran. We are here, one of one of those rare few, a WSOP main event champion. Forget the shades. It's all about the lizard eyes. We welcome the fossil man himself, Mr. Greg Raymer. How's it going, Greg? Hey, Chris. Thanks so much for welcoming me to, welcoming me to your show. Glad to be here. And uh, let's have some fun with this. Yeah, tell us, what are you up to these days? How's your 2021 been? Uh, not too exciting from a poker point of view. Okay. Um, no really huge results. Um, just came back from my, uh, you know, instead of summer in Vegas, the fall in Vegas with the World Series and the other tournaments. And uh, I had a win in one of the smaller events I played, but uh, not much else. So... It was funny. One of my students emailed me, was saying like, "Wow, you had such a great series!" Because she saw a whole list of caches. But oh, it's like, yeah. but they're all like, you know, you like you get a bunch of min caches. That doesn't do you much good. I did have one good result though. I'll be in your side of the pond, um, presumably next fall, for whenever they finally schedule the uh, Poker Stars Players Championship. Mm, amazing. That, that was that was the tournament that I did win. Was uh, um, good friend of mine, Robbie Straczynski, runs Card Player Lifestyle, and he was doing a mixed game festival okay. at one of the uh, smaller poker rooms in town, the Westgate. And I was going to play the $1,500 stud tournament at the World Series one afternoon. And as I was about to leave my room, I see on Twitter that like Caesar's computers are down worldwide. Okay. Like all their all their computer systems are down, and so you can't register. For a tournament and so they've already pushed back the start time of that stud event and i'm just like this is like my first week there i wasn't you know it's three time zones away from where i live here in north carolina i wasn't really on that late night vegas time frame yet and i was just like yeah i don't want to go enter this tournament and have to play until four in the morning or maybe later mm -hmm. and so i uh thought, well, what else is going on? And like, hey, it's the uh, third day of Robbie's Mixed Game Festival, which I love. So I went to Westgate, and it was just 4-8 limit dealer's choice. Mm -hmm. And they were playing pretty much anything you could imagine. There was games I've never heard of. <laughs> okay. And and I play all the games. And, uh, and then people kept asking me, like, are you going to play the tournament tomorrow? And I'm like, I hadn't planned on it. It was a $200 horse tournament. But then it was like, oh, wait, you know, we're going to essentially be capped at 120 players. It's going to be like a $20,000 prize pool. Um, but Poker Stars is adding a platinum pass worth $30,000 for the winner. Huge added So value. essentially it's like, yeah, you're getting like 150% overlay guaranteed. Yeah. And so I... Uh, I forget what was on the schedule that next day at the World Series or at the win or some of the other series, but it was nothing that I minded missing. So I decided to play the horse tournament and won that. So now, <laughs> A wise decision then. <laughs> you know. So, you know, yeah, that worked out. I mean, it's like almost 5,000 cash for the winner, plus you get the, the pass. Oh, nice. Congratulations. So, so that will... Uh, you know, bring with it. Presumably, they're saying it's almost certainly going to be in Barcelona sometime nice, in the fall. Nice. I think I think they're waiting for. You know, they don't want to announce it too far in advance because they're worried about changes due to COVID and stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I it's, mean, it's every other week, right? <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen. The yeah. restrictions change. I mean, there's already like 260 pass winners, and most mm -hmm. of those. I think this is the first one actually since COVID that they gave out. Um, oh, well. the one that I just won and so all those people were winning passes back in like 2019 and mm -hmm. early 2020 and now it was like oh well you won this thing and you're just gonna have to wait but I mean the thing is it's not like you can come at them and say well pay me my money because it's it's always added yeah you know? exactly it's it's not like they took it out of the prize pool that's a bonus you know so since it's added money, they have a lot more, you know, sway in terms of like, yeah, you know, Chris, you can't sit there and threaten to sue us and stuff <laughs> if we don't pay, you know, making uh -huh. making you wait for your money because we gave it to you. It was free. Yeah. You know, if you won the tournament, you uh, the only reason you would be in any hardship is if you made some kind of deal. Mm -hmm. 
which obviously could have happened. Like when I'm heads up with the guy and yeah, exactly. It's it's essentially thirty five thousand for first and like twenty five hundred for second. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and obviously depending upon stack sizes, you could imagine someone making a deal where it's like, oh God, I'm going to give you all the first place money. Plus here's another few thousand out of my pocket. You're going to let me win the pass. So you could actually be out of pocket for the thing. Hmm. And it's not like that. I mean, you might've made a great deal. At yeah. That price. Yeah. It's you a know, really you, interesting one. But I mean, that didn't happen. Discussions of deal never, never came up with us. And it was a very fast-paced event. I mean, it's limit two, which the variance is always higher. Mm -hmm. um, been playing poker for a long time, like almost 30 years now. And before the poker boom, back in like 03, 04, 05, most tournaments were limit. Yeah. And it was much more common for the guy who was like, you know, you'd ask like, who won the poker tournament last night, you know, at your local card room? And they'd say a name and you'd be like, like that? donk one like he's the worst <laughs> and that that was going to happen way more often than back then when it was limit hold them yeah, yeah instead of no limit hold them like that really horrible player just he, he uh you know the nature of the game the variance is so much higher hmm. there's so many situations where the best and the worst players in the world will essentially make the exact same decisions on each street that uh there's yes, less limited. opportunity. Yeah, there's less opportunity for you to utilize a great read. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of like, oh, you're pretty sure I'm bluffing, but your hand only beats bluffs. You're going to call on the river. But it's like, well, wait, you were getting 12 to 1. You were going to call anyway. <laughs> exactly. So the fact that you the fact that you read me for a bluff doesn't help. No. Because you make the same decision you would have made if you couldn't read me and limit hold them. Yeah, it's very limited. I mean, I remember uh, when I first started playing poker, and like that, it, it, was, it was very common to play limit poker. I mean, even from the beginning, I just found it so boring, I think, because it was like, well, I'm limited. You just feel limited when you're playing it, especially when you've played no limit. Well, I, I prefer limit for cash games. I think it okay. makes a much better cash game. Um, the problem is in a tournament setting, mm. a limit tournament, no matter how good of a structure you give us, before we get even all that close to the money, no one has chips. If you if you go back and could look at like the records from like the first 50k championship at the World Series, and it would just be horse the first few years, mm -hmm. and you would you would start with like 140 players, and it was a five day long tournament. So I mean, obviously this is a good structure. It takes five yeah, full days to a winner, but they're going to pay the final two tables of 16. And when you were sitting there at 40 players, the average stack was like 15 to 20 small bets, you know, or 15 to 20 blinds in a, in a mm. game like Hold'em or, or Omaha with, with blinds. So, you know, even fairly fast structured, no limit tournaments, 15 blinds is considered crapshoot territory. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and that's not, you know, a five day structure like mm -hmm. we're talking. So, I mean, even in that tournament, it just meant that you had very more play at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So now your skill could increase your odds of making it, let's say to the final half, the final third of the field. But once you got to that point, there was just so many things where it was just going to be like, oops, like you, nothing you could do about it. Like we could debate how you should have played that hand. But maybe every great player in the world would say, you were never supposed to fold, Chris. And the only question is, how many bets were you going to lose since you ended up losing this pot? Mm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you seem to play so many variants, though, Greg, of poker. And you've played for such a long time. Like, what is it that draws you to this game? I mean, you must really love it. I cannot say exactly why it is I like poker. Because I'm also, I'm, I'm not interested in, it's not like I love all card games. Okay. You know, I don't play much of anything else. You know, it's not like I was ever into gin rummy or mm -hmm. bridge or, you know, many other card games. It's like, even if I've played them and I know them, they don't appeal to me anywhere near as much. So I, I suspect it's just the money. It's like, I like cards and money. So if you and I, if you and I were playing hearts for, for money, maybe I would find that game more interesting. 
but many of those games, you know, people don't play bridge for money that commonly. Obviously, they do. Um, you know, but it's not like, I mean, even if you're getting together with your aunts and uncles and grandparents and stuff, and you're playing cards at a family gathering, if you're playing poker, you're playing for some kind of money, even if it's like M&Ms, so to speak, or some little token like that. There's still something that has some little bit of value that you're playing for. Mm -hmm. But if you are sitting around the table playing, you know, Uno or, or Rummy or something, you, you wouldn't be playing for money. Even yeah. if you were even if you were keeping score and you got to say, hey, I, I beat Uncle Phil and, and Aunt Carol and blah, 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 it'd be like, but you would just have the thrill of victory, but you wouldn't get anything for it. Yeah, exactly. It's like a representation of the work and the skill and the effort put in, right? Yeah. I mean, I have some f relatives in Michigan that would used to play like a little home game tournament like once a month or so for five bucks. And, but if it was free, people would have played very different and it wouldn't have been as competitive. You know, they wouldn't have been, a, they wouldn't have been trying to win as hard. Exactly. So yeah. like, how did you get started in poker? When did you, you know, play for money and realize, you know what, this is what I want to do. Well, you know, I, I definitely learned the rules somewhere as a child, though I okay. do not recall where, because I know when I went to college in my fraternity, we would play a nickel dime quarter game two, maybe three times a year. Someone would be like, let's play poker. And, and a handful of us would get in their room and we would literally be using coins, mm -hmm. nickels, dimes, and quarters. And uh, if you were the big, big winner, we're talking $10, $15. Um, and, and we had fun, but it, it's not like I took it serious or anyone else took it serious and, and, we're talking back in the eighties and if there was any reasonable poker books available at that time, I don't, I sure didn't know about them. Uh -huh. So uh, it was just, and then I kind of did the same thing when I went off to grad school and law school, I would invite friends over maybe a couple times a year, we'd play poker like that. And it was really just an excuse to hang out and, you know, bullshit each other and, you know, kind of, you know, your guys being guys kind of evening. But I also got into card counting while I was in school. I was going to University of Minnesota, and they had recently had uh, the introduction of tribal casinos there. Okay. That became my student job. So instead of like, you know, part-time job waiting tables or the typical student job to make some uh -huh. extra money, I would go to the casino and count cards playing blackjack. <laughs> Amazing. And, and I was making like seven bucks an hour. It was like the average result after years of doing that and that was like double or triple the minimum wage at the time yeah and and you get to set your own hours mm -hmm. so it was a great way and then when i finished law school i got a job as an attorney at a law firm in chicago and they had riverboat casinos route in the suburbs and when i went to those riverboats i found that i couldn't really beat these games mm. i mean i i could but for me to make enough money that it was worth spending any time at it now that I actually have a real job making real money, mm. it was kind of like, oh, if I wanted to make, let's say, an hourly rate similar to what I was getting paid, I was going to have to have a bankroll of several hundred thousand dollars and be playing really quite big because the edge that I could get against those games was so okay. tiny. Yeah, yeah. And I accidentally, a friend said, well, here, there's these like charity casinos that pop up around town. And when I went to this place uh, called Rockford Charity Casinos, they had poker games. And I just was like, well, I can see the black checks a waste of my time. I'll, I'm already here. Let's have some fun. Maybe this will be kind of like with my buddies in college. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'll I'll just play poker. And they have like three, six limit hold'em and an Omaha high-low. And uh, it's, even though... You know, I can look back and say, man, like those players were really bad poker players. They were not very skillful. Um, they still would talk about things like someone would be saying to you, if you were at the table, they were like, Chris, what were you doing? Like you, you didn't have pot odds to chase that draw. And I'm sitting there going like, mm. what's pot odds? You know? Yeah, Never exactly. You're a complete newbie, right? So. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they weren't good, but I was worse Yeah. in the sense that I had no real knowledge. And that's all that matters, and I, right? 
I went to a used bookstore and I they had three poker books, so I bought all three. Two of them were fun, you know, interesting little reads. The third one, though, happened to be The Theory of Poker by David Sklansky. Classic. And that one actually, you know, even now I would recommend that to people as yeah. a book they should read. Because, and it's, it's the kind of approach that appeals to me because he's not saying like, here's a chart of starting hands or things mm -hmm. like that. It's like, no, here are these fundamental theorems. Here are these concepts like pot odds. You know, let's have a chapter on pot odds and explain mm -hmm. that. And then let's have a chapter on implied odds and then reverse implied odds. And so here are these concepts that you use to drive your decision making. Mm -hmm. And and he's taking examples from flop games, from stud games, from draw games to, uh, you know, hit home these concepts. And that's the way I like to learn. And like, I have my own book now focused mm -hmm. on tournament poker, Fossil Man's Winning Tournament Strategies. And it's the same thing. I'm not giving you a chart of like, play these hands in early position and, you know, and raise with these and call with those and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, because there's too much fluidity to the game. The, the situations are always so different. Mm -hmm. If I was going to try to give you charts, I'd have to give you hundreds of charts because mm -hmm. like, okay, here's a chart when you have, you know, 10 or less big blinds. And here's a chart if you have 15 or so. And, you know, you'd need different charts for yeah, stack yeah. sizes. And and then how how many chips do you like? Okay, you have a thousand blinds, but your opponents all have 10 to 20. You know, it's, it's you would, there's so much variation. Yeah, it's endless. And, then, and, I, and I always tell people this as well. Like, you know, there's, all this GTO software knocking around and people are just following it blindly. But I mean, we're, we're human beings, we're not robots. So if you're just blindly following certain charts and not adjusting, uh, you're not playing correctly anyway. Well, that's a separate issue in a sense. I mean, you've, you know, you could have all these great charts and if you could memorize, no human brain is capable of it, but if mm -hmm. you could memorize perfect GTO strategy, you could follow that, and ignore everything else and you'd be a winning player that's mm -hmm. the definition of gto mm -hmm. so if it actually is an you know a correct gto solution for the game you're in then it's profitable to follow it but you can make much more money if you're able to adjust and exploit the opponents you're playing against at the time exactly. and you know and, and but there's also just like charts in a book it'd be one thing in a cash game where people tend to be deeper stacked and you're not as worried about situations where like, Oh, I've got 50 blinds, but this guy only has 10. Maybe I shouldn't open with my suited connector because of this guy shoves. Now I'm like, well, crap, you know, like I don't want to, I put in three blinds. I don't want to fold for seven more, but I also know that my seven, six suited is behind. Mm -hmm. Now I'm putting in 10 big blinds as an underdog. Um, so maybe I needed to tighten up and not make that first raise with the suited connector because this guy's behind me with his short stack. And that scenario doesn't pop up as much in a cash game because people don't usually sit on 10 blinds. No, but in, a in a tournament, though, constantly you've got people like that, you know, once you get past the first few levels. But also things like, you know, in a GTO computer would still take this into account like, oh, we're getting close to the bubble. I'm a big stack. I'm going to be more loose aggressive because these people are going to be correct to fold much more often than they had been previously. So your GTO can take into account a lot of these changes in situation, but it still doesn't adjust for the fact that Chris is way too tight or way too loose or you're too aggressive or too passive or whatever. You overplay flush draws or you don't semi bluff aggressively enough. Um, so whatever mistakes you might be making, if I'm aware of that, I can adjust and take advantage of it. The GTO computer won't know to adjust and take it because it's not paying any attention to how you are playing. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, my best example for the difference between like GTO and, and exploitative is imagine, you know, you sit down at the tournament and on the first hand, this guy goes all in for his 200 big blinds. The GTO computer is going to look down, and if it doesn't have two aces, it's going to fold. 
Mm-hmm. And now, but the guy goes all in on the second hand and the third mm-hmm. and the fourth and the fifth. And the GTO computer doesn't adjust for the fact that he's done it eight times in a row. Mm-hmm. It, it's still just saying it's 200 blinds. I don't have aces. I fold. Mm-hmm. You and I are obviously going to, you know, start loosening up our standards and we're going to be willing to call this guys all in with a lot less than just a pair of aces at some point. And we still need to take into account like, oh, he's on my right and he's gone all in and I've got the whole table behind me. So maybe I'm not going to call here with ace 10 mm-hmm. for, for fear that the third player also joins the pot and now I'm behind. But if it was just me and that guy left, then I'm calling with a huge range of hands because I know I'm a favorite, you know, to win the chips in the pot. But the GTO computer just isn't going to make that kind of an obvious, even though it's an obvious adjustment yeah. to you and me, it, it's like it's programming. It doesn't look it, at history. No, exactly. It's Yeah, it's just the raw, raw hand. Uh, it's an interesting uh, spot as well, because you mentioned about aces. And I, I think I heard an argument before where, you know, if you're really that good a player, maybe it's not so true now because people are a lot better, but you should kind of fold aces in the first level or something getting it all in because your edge is too good no. but i mean it's just never the no, case now it's never that's never it's, it never was the case okay that's a fall um, it's a myth everybody it's been debunked <laughs> yes i mean a a friend of mine wrote an article for card player magazine quite a while ago where he did the math and he assumed that you were a three times better than average player yeah, I mean, and it was this scenario. His wasn't folding aces per se, but it was this guy has gone all in like first hand of the main event, and his cards have been exposed. Okay, so you know what he has. You know whether you, I mean. So if you're behind, you fold. The question he was trying to answer is, how far ahead do you have to be where it's correct to call? Exactly. And and without a doubt, if we're assuming everyone's equally skilled. And, and we're also assuming there's no one left behind you. It's just you and the person who's gone all in. Um, if you're an average player, then if you're 5149, it's clearly a correct call because mm-hmm. ICM doesn't exist firsthand of the tournament. So his question, though, was like, what if you're three times better than average? Mm-hmm. How big of an advantage, you know, do you need to be like 7525? You know, do you have to be a three to one favorite to win this pot to correctly call or is it some other number? And his math surprised him. It surprised me when I read the article. Six um, percent. It was correct to call. So if you were 53, 47 favorite. Wow. You're correct. You're correct to call. Wow. Um, <laughs> so you had, yeah. you had, if, if the guy had shown ace king and you had queens, you're like, well, that's more than 53, 47. I call even yeah. though, you know. You know, we're, and we're saying you are a way above average player. You're one yeah. of the best players in the field. It was still more profitable to call than it was to fold in that spot. Super interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it seemed like a silly, uh, silly myth, but it was definitely something I heard before. Um, what no. would you attribute to your success, Greg? You know, like what is it that makes a great professional poker player? Well, there's a variety of things. Um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna come at it this way. I've had many hundreds, at least three or 400 people over the years who've come up to me, people I don't know who are saying like they want some advice because they're thinking of like quitting their job or quitting school to turn pro. And I always tell them, don't do it. Um, invariably, like even if I'd played with them at the same table for a while and I knew and I could tell they, they were a good player, I tell them not to do it. Um, most of them aren't good enough. Having not seen them play them almost every time they ask me this, they're just not, I just still know they're not good enough players. Mm -hmm. Um, people, that's funny. That's like the article I just about to send into card players, like how we all overrate ourselves. We, we think we're better than we are. (laughs) That's so true. The classic poker. Um, and, but even if you have the skill, you now have a lot of players who are skillful enough, but then they still go broke because they do things like bet on sports or they, you know, play craps or other casino games where they don't have an edge. And so they might be a winning poker player, but they're losing gambler. Yeah. And then you get the next hurdle, which is some of them, maybe they don't play those games, those other games, 
or they don't really lose at those other games. Um, but then they get into the party lifestyle because they're living in a town like Vegas or LA mm -hmm. and they blow it all on like drugs and partying and all that kind of stuff. So they still end up going broke. And then finally, if you can survive all those things, um, I've run into many people like this where it's like, well, I've been making a good living as a poker player now for 10 years, but I'm just, I'm bored. I, I don't want to do it anymore. Mm. But what kind of job am I going to get with this huge gap in my resume? So well, podcast even if, host. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're saying like, you know, how many people can make a solid living hosting a podcast? Yeah. Sure. You know, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, mo mo most of the podcasts that have really big audiences, it's like, oh, well, it's the podcast by Conan O'Brien mm -hmm. that he gets to plug on his TV show as, as well as, you know. So, I mean, he's got a built in huge audience and he'll get corporate sponsors and mm -hmm. they'll pay plenty of money for him to mention them on the breaks. It's just it's hard to find a, that other job that's going to be a dependable income for you and especially if you're you know fairly good and yo oh, you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year playing poker like even if oh i finished my degree even but i finished my degree and then it's and i was 22 years old and now i'm 35 and i've been playing poker all this time and never had that real job mm -hmm. companies you know the, the company that might have hired you out of school it doesn't really want to hire you now no no for sure you know or they're a lot less likely to so it's it's you know, I, I tell them, like, if, if poker is that important to you, keep your job. But if you live in a place like I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is not a poker hotbed. You know, it's it's you drive for hours or you play in a home game. And and that's really not an easy way to make a living playing in home games and stuff because the rake is super high and all that. Yeah. So instead, if like if I was talking to someone around here and they wanted to go pro, I'd be like, look, what do you do? Oh, you sell real estate get a job selling real estate you know in southern florida and in vegas and southern california and in houston you know some city that has lots of poker rooms and lots of games and tournaments available go there and be the accountant or the realtor or whatever it is that you're doing for a living now well, it's and, interesting. I mean, it's interesting because we, we have a lot of poker players in Malta. It's quite a common thing. And obviously, I mean, I was yeah. a poker player myself and you, you essentially described my story, you know, <laughs> I literally played for like 12 <laughs> years. <laughs> sorry, sorry, mate. You know, uh, psychic, uh, you know, describe my story after 12 years. So many people here, they they couldn't win or, you know, they didn't enjoy it anymore. And, but we're quite lucky in Malta mm -hmm. um, that there's so many gaming companies. There's actually quite a, quite a demand for those kind of uh, people in this industry. So we're actually quite fortunate, yeah. fortunate here, but, but I also think people that play for a very long time, you know, yeah. like seven years, eight years, 10 years, as you said, the skill sets required, uh, it's not just being a good player. I mean, there's really a lot to it. And I think those people in general will be able to be successful in other areas, but maybe they have to start at the bottom. Maybe they have to train or yeah. in another, in another way. And, and yeah, that, that is going to suck once you've, once you've been doing it for so long, but um, yeah, I think skill sets are so important for poker. It is. I mean, and so it's, it's not just like, I know, how to make great decisions mm. as I play the game, but you have to make them. There's, there's lots of players out there um, who are capable, like their A game is world-class, but they don't play their A game all the time. They go on tilt. They yeah. play when they're drunk. They exactly. play, you know, they don't, they, they're incapable of playing their best game if it's not big enough. Mm. Um, you know, so you'll see them, you know, really focused and playing great poker when they're in the 10K buy-in event at the World Series. But then they show up at your table in the $1,500 event, the $800 event, and, and they're just horrible. Um, and to me, that's actually a sign of a, just a huge flaw in your game. Um, you know, for good and bad, like I can, I, I can play bad. I can make mistakes. I cannot play bad on purpose or because I got yeah, this game small. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Like I'm trying just as hard, you know, in a three, six limit hold'em cash game as I am in a 300, 600 limit mix game. 
I completely still, agree. I'm still it's trying, like, I want to beat these guys. I want to, like, I want to put a green number in my ledger <laughs> that made me, you know, I don't want a red number, even if it's minus 80. And it's like, ah, who cares? It's only 80 bucks. I'm like, no. Like, no, losing it's, isn't fun. Exactly. Losing it's isn't a, fun. It's a mindset. A guy here in the office as well, you know, we, we used to play and it would be on Friday night, just a friendly game, it's called, you know, with drinks or whatever. But for me, I could never sure. just not take it seriously because it's like, you're just pre-programmed once you've done it for so many years it's like no like i'm playing this to win what's the point i'm not gambling you know this is yeah this is why we do well, it. i mean i can i can sit there and chat with the guys and all that and have fun mm -hmm. yeah. and i and i and i try to have fun every time i play because if it's not fun now it's like it's become a real job and if it's going to be like that if it's going to feel the same to you emotionally as working on an assembly line, well, then, well, why not get something that's safer, more dependable, that has yeah. benefits and stuff, you know? <laughs> I, I, I might as well get the office job again and like, okay, now I'll have like my health care is paid for. I don't have to pay for it on the side. Uh -huh. And uh, and I'm going to, if I have a bad day at the office, I'm still going to get just as much money as I did yesterday on my good day. Um, so if, if it's not fun, why bother? To me, that's yeah. actually one of the most kind of amazing things is when you go to the poker rooms, you'll always see these guys who are regular players who mm -hmm. just, they seem miserable even when they're winning. Yeah. And I'm like, why are you playing yeah. this game? Why do you play so much when like you, you appear to enjoy being miserable? <laughs> that, maybe that's, that's the enjoyment like. you've nailed it they enjoy being miserable <laughs> i yeah i guess i mean i guess that's like some people want someone to spank them and you know that <laughs> is their thing i'm like why man like i don't you know i don't enjoy pain i don't enjoy suffering uh -huh. but i don't yeah i don't know what it is but there are guys that just you know if they win they'll like still complain about, ah, you know, that river card killed my action. I could have gotten another $200 out of that guy. If that river card hadn't been a heart, they're like, like, dude, you flop quads, you got paid off. Like you, you decided you had to size down on the river because of the hearts. Oh, boo hoo. But it's just know? the mind mindset. I mean, these people will do the same thing in real life. Like I, I think there's a lot of, um, crossover between you know how you handle yourself in poker and your mindset and the way you handle things in real life like you definitely see that uh let, let's talk about the main event Greg, because obviously that is the big one you know there's not sure. many people that have managed to one get to a final table and two actually win the thing so i mean you entered the main event probably thinking right here i am let's do this and then you did it <laughs> yeah I mean, I mean, what was that it's... experience like well, obviously, it was it was great fun, um, you know, and, and the same is true anytime you win. Uh, people often ask me, what did it feel like? And I just say, like, well, take any time that you've won. So if you've won any poker tournament, even a small one, um, if you had success in sports as when you were younger, you know, and your team won the big game, it's the same feeling, only it's like, OK, now it's not winning this tournament and collecting thousand dollars it's five million dollars and it's the world championship so it's yeah. like it's just it's just ample it's the same feeling but amplified did uh and i don't i don't know of any better way to describe it uh-huh and i mean you know some people would almost you know flounder or feel the pressure in terms of the money jumps you know it's like it's life-changing money and you know whilst you're playing a game and you're trying to make the best decisions it's also hard to forget that fact like how did you find that aspect of being at the final table well, the nice thing being the, the chip leader the whole time is that you're not worried about like missing the next pay jump. Did you know that like if, if this, yeah, if this hand goes wrong, I'm still here. Yeah. And, uh, and I had a fairly substantial chip lead at all times. So the majority of the time it was like, okay, you and I are seeing a flop. It's like, even if I lose this hand and double Chris up, I'm still the chip leader. Yeah. Kind of a thing. So that obviously removes a lot of those pressures. But still, just any time I play poker, it's like I am aware of pay jumps. And but I'm not saying to myself, like, oh, Greg, like, look at the scoreboard and like, man, if I make two more spots, I, I get another thousand dollars or whatever. It it's like, yes, that is a factor. 
but all I'm trying to do is make the most profitable decision. So every time it's my action, you know, fold, check, bet, raise, call, whatever, it's like, which of these decisions do I think on average will be the highest mm -hmm. equity? So for me, I'm just thinking about that equity and I'm not thinking about other stuff. I don't worry about like, I say in my book, like tournament life is a meaning, meaningless concept. You know, if we look at a scenario, you know, and you played a hand and now your opponent has gone all in and has you covered, you know, well, we'll, you know, now that we're not there and we have all the time in the world, we'll sit back and we're like, okay, you have these cards. If there's a flop, here's what's out there. Here's the range we put him on. Mm -hmm. If you, if you fold, we can do the math, the ICM and say, how much is your stack worth when you fold? And like, if you call, it's like, okay, it's going to be worth zero or it's going to be worth this. So we can calculate all three of those numbers and then say, okay, so according to those numbers, you need to win this. If you call, you need to win 35% of the time or the more, or more, and it's more profitable to call than it is to fold. And then we can estimate how often you'll win. And if we do all that math correctly, you know, we come up with a reasonable range of hands and, and so on to put the opponent on, you know, if it says, oh, you're going to win 45% of the time if you call here, well, then you can't then say, well, but wait, if I call and lose, I'm out. Like, no, we, we already <laughs> did the math we did already took into account that if you called and lost, you were done and you were going to get the next payout, whatever it was like. Mm -hmm. So we did that, like calling is worth this much money because you'll get paid that much or you'll have a stack with an equity of this higher number. We, we've done the math. We can't then say like, oh, it's 45 percent chance of winning. We only need 35 percent. Oh, but if we lose, we're out. So we'll fold anyway. Yeah, that's like, where the that's where know, the emotions like, come in. You know, it's not part of the decision. Yeah. But how, how much of a factor is live reads? I mean, it depends. In many cases, none. Some people are hard to read well. Mm -hmm. But I definitely have made much, much more money than I've lost by adjusting because of a live read. Mm -hmm. I've made some horrible mistakes because of a bad read. Many times I have been correct and my opponent was wrong, so to speak. Like, I had a funny hand a, a, year, a year or so ago where... I had like raised pre-flop and had flopped second pair and I had C bet the flop heads up and my opponent called and everything about it made me think that I was ahead, mm -hmm. that they were on maybe on a draw or something or they had like a middle pair and didn't believe me. And then I bet again on the turn and they kind of hesitantly called. And now the river brought like the third flush card you know, like, oh, now there's the, you know, it was like, oh, it paired the high card and was a third diamond. And now my opponent's like, boom, they're all in. And I'm like, well, shit, that's like the worst card, you know. <laughs> but but everything, I'm sitting there staring at them and everything about them was just their body language. Everything was just like, please fold, please fold, please fold, you know, like desperate for me to fold. Mm. So I was like, well, they must be decided this was a great bluff card. And it is. I mean, if you didn't, if it didn't improve your hand, it was a great card to bluff with. And I called with my second pair and they turned over the nut flush. And I was just like, man, and I was like, good hand, you know, I was like, man, I, I, I was so wrong. I really thought you wanted me to fold. And, and it was clear this guy was not acting. He was being genuine. He was just like, oh, I did. I did. I was worried you had a full house. <laughs> And I'm just like, but then, like, if you were worried I had a full house, why would you go all in? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I didn't, I didn't say any of that. I just was like, ah, you know, good hand. But in my mind, I'm like, what, what is wrong with you? Why would you shove all in with a flush and be thinking to yourself, please fold? I'm like, did you think I was going to fold a full house? So I think what happened is I just ran into a player who was weak enough, you know, newbie enough whatever that he's just like oh i made my flush i need to bet but the board paired i'm worried and i really want him to fold so i'm gonna bet as big as i can to try to make sure he folds but it's like dude if i just made a full house i even if it was the bottom full house i'm not folding it's like hell i called you with second pair like obviously i'm not folding a full house
Yeah, I've seen so I've seen that, was, that before. It's <laughs> it's pretty yeah. interesting. I mean, like my read was dead on, but his the, the, his feelings made no sense given his hand. Yeah, yeah, I can understand. So, I mean, so in a sense, like you said, you made the right read, but uh, it just didn't work out because he actually had one of those rare hands where he just didn't know what he was doing at all. Yes, and I've and I've made a fold where I was like, oh, my opponent is just exuding confidence. Mm -hmm. They're just like they're sure they have the best hand. I'm like, okay, I've got like top pair only. I'll fold. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, they've got second pair, and they're like, ah, and they're like, God, man, I thought I finally had you. You've been beating me all day. I thought yeah. I finally had you this I time. Overvalued it. <laughs> yeah. So they they thought they had the best hand with their second pair, and and they didn't. But I read them correctly. Yeah. And, well, you, and, well, you, and, and, yeah, it well, you, you were hard to read, weren't you, Greg, in the in the main event with those uh, recognizable glasses that you you wore? Talk, talk us uh, about how you decided, like, okay, I'm just going to put these on. Well, I played the main event for the first time in 02. Mm -hmm. so that was the year Varconi won, and and I went fairly deep, like 80th place or something. Uh, not the money, but uh, it was in a sense. It turned out to be a great thing, but at the time, I was like, well. When I got knocked out, I'm like, well, one thing for sure, I'm never going to not play this tournament. If I can help it, I'll be in this tournament every year, forever, because it was just such a wonderful experience, even though I, you know, took a bad beat and got knocked out short of the money. Uh -huh. But uh, I had been at Disney World with my family a couple of months before the main event in 02. Um, daughter's a huge Disney fan. It has been, you know, like since she was a little girl, as you would expect, but she still is now at age 25. And my wife and daughter would always spend time in the gift shops, which means I spend time in the gift shops. And one of the rides is called the Tower of Terror ride. Sounds fun. And, and oh, it's a, it's a very fun ride. It's a kind of an elevator thing where you yep. like shoot you up and down <laughs> super fast, but uh, it, you actually exit into the back of the gift shop and you have to have to walk through the gift shop to get back to the park. So they're looking at stuff. And as I'm looking at stuff as well, they have these just novelty sunglass things with different hologram images on them. Like, oh, this one has a skull on each one. This one has just like a human eyeball. And I saw I never wore sunglasses when I played poker, but I thought, oh, this would be funny. I'm going to get a pair of these. And then when I'm in this main event in a couple of months, at some point, I'm going to be in a big pot and I'm going to put these on. <laughs> and, and so middle of day one, I'm like, you know, my opponent has like bet the flop and I've raised him and he's now down here and he's counting his chips and like, okay, like here's how much the raises and this is, you know, so he's taken and I'm like, Ooh, ooh this is a good time. The moment. I, <laughs> I pulled him out and I'm just sitting there staring at him from the far side of the, you know, we're far ends of the table. And then when he finally like, looked up from counting he was just like Whoa. You know, <laughs> like it was like if you've seen it where you, like you would have fallen over backwards except you like catch your foot on the bottom of the table yeah like that's how hard he like jumped back in his chair that like wow it was a tense if, moment if, 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 if not for the table he would have fallen over and and then he's just like what the what and then he you know mucked his cards and i was like well maybe this isn't just a one-time joke and yeah so after that every time you know, pre-flop, if I looked at my cards and I'm like, oh, I'm going to play this hand, I would put out the chips for the call or the raise, put the fossil on top of the cards to protect them, and then I'd put on the glasses, and then I'd just sit there for the rest of the hand like that, and I'm just staring at you, and and of course, those things never blink, and what I've learned, you know, after a few months after that was that it just annoyed the hell out of people. It's just super annoying, those unblinking eyes staring at you. It just looks like you have eyes on you constantly, yeah. Yeah, it's just very annoying. And so I think um, at the end of the day, people fold it a little bit more often. So maybe if I hadn't been wearing those glasses all day long versus wearing them, now I'm getting maybe two or three or four extra folds that I wouldn't have gotten. And, and most of the times you want people to fold. Yeah. Um, obviously, sometimes you have the nuts and you want them to get it all in with you. But I mean, just even imagine a real common hand like you raise with ace king and the big blind calls and it comes king seven four and, and you put out a C bet. 
Yeah, you're not bluffing in any sense. You're like, you almost certainly have the best hand. But you're also thinking like, well, if he doesn't fold, then maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he has a set or two pair. Or he has like, a you know, five, six for the straight draw. Or maybe if there's two to a suit, he has a flush draw. So even though you're not bluffing, you you kind of hope the guy folds. Because if he doesn't fold, that means you you know, your chances of winning just went way down because mm-hmm. he might have you beat now or he might catch a card to beat you. So since you want people to fold much more often than you want them to call, you know, if you get them to fold a little bit more often. Yeah, that then... would help for sure. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm buying some glasses and taking them to the next live event, I think, because I definitely want people to fold, fold more often. So if that's the secret recipe, I'm, I'm all in. I mean... It may work. That's that was my theory as to what it you know. But I, I don't wear them anymore because they're just too dark. I misread the <laughs> I misread the board. That's the real problem. Uh, I mean, I I have Blue Shark Optics, which is a brand of eyewear made for poker, and I wear those if I want to hide my eyes because then it's they're made for poker, so they hide your eyes, but you can still see everything clearly. Mm-hmm. Whereas your typical sunglasses, you know, make everything darker. I don't have the best eyesight. It's just, and I, and I made that mistake once and learned my lesson when I misread the board. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, I, they were so iconic. I just remember it was always very entertaining to, to, yeah. to watch for sure. No, I, I, I'm glad I was wearing them. It, it, it's, I mean, like ESPN actually asked me to come in early to do an interview way before it was like deep enough in the tournament that it was because I was, a, a big stack and it was just centered around the glasses and then they were asking other players so like when you watch the <laughs> dvd of the l4 main event like it's still only like day two or three and you'll see this little segment the, the nut segment thing they called it you know about the glasses and you know and like i remember elio lesra was one of the players who they had you know, he's sitting at the table and they're talking to him over here while I'm at the far end of the table. And uh-huh. he's like, like, yeah, there's glasses. I don't know what to think or something he says. And, you know, other people make a comment here and there because they've just asked them, hey, what about those glasses? What do you think? And so they, they interviewed me and added that to the broadcast. And at that point, of course, they don't know that it's like, oh, he's going to actually go really deep in the tournament. And if I hadn't, if I'd been knocked out on end of day three or something maybe that segment never airs i don't know mm. yeah yeah it's true well well we're very thankful it did because it was it was very entertaining <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm more thankful i made it rather than that well, I, if you want to don't air the segment and let me win mm-hmm. i'll take that deal <laughs> so who who were the toughest players you've played do you think in terms of poker oh it's you know there's there's so many players that are tough and there's, especially nowadays, there's so many strong, strong players that, uh, and the thing is, I don't play the same person often enough for me to say like, oh, like Chris, you're my nemesis. You're my Achilles. Yeah. Teal. You know, like, it doesn't matter even if you are one of the best players I've played against, how often am I going to play against you where it really is an issue? So it's, it's not like, you know, and if someone says, well, who are the best players? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't play against all of them enough. I mean, if, if you're a bad player, I can figure that out fairly quickly because mm-hmm. you'll, you'll do some obvious mistakes. But if you're a good player, I have to play with you for a long time to see whether you are a good player who's a little better or a little worse than this other really good player. Mm-hmm. Because now we're talking little things, but like, oh, if you're just a horrible player, you're going to do some really stupid donk moves, mm-hmm. you know, several times an hour, maybe, and it'll become apparent. I might, it might take me a long time to really nail you down and be able to play perfect against you, but it'll be apparent that you're not a very good player right away. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, I, I mainly play online, but then when I play live, it's so many times that some of these players, they seem to have bet sizing okay, they seem, their demeanor seems okay, everything is going fine, and then you think they're a fairly competent or okay player, you know, not a complete fish, and then they turn over one of their hands and you're like, what just happened? <laughs> what just well, happened? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that always is the case. To be honest, I... I do a lot of private lessons over Zoom, and the biggest mistake that I tend to see from my students is bet sizing. 
Okay. So that's one where I will see those errors yeah. more quickly, especially in the live game, but uh, where they just, you know, and, and it's too frequent, at least with my students where it's, you know, and of course that's the, one of the first things we work on is there's too much of the bet sizing tied to the strength of their hand. You know, it's like, oh, I'm betting bigger when I bluff and smaller when I want you to call. And I'm like, yeah, but the thing is, if your opponent is even slightly competent, they're going to pick up on that before too long and use it against you. So you can't tie the strength of your hand to the bet sizing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and if you do, it needs to be a scenario where you don't play against this person. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm going to head out when we're done with this interview. I'm driving off to the far side of the state for a circuit event. Nice. And and since I won't be playing against those people a lot, I could make exploitable mistakes like that. Mm -hmm. But if I'm, you know, talking to one of my students and they're playing like in a private game online a lot or a private home game with the same people, you can't be, doing that kind of systematic mistake anymore because they will even even mediocre players will pick up on the fact that like oh you bet bigger when you are bluffing hmm. yeah and it's so, true you know the skill has gone up greatly for you know recreational players the skill advancement is just crazy um what what advice would you have for anyone going into a world series final table well first have fun like, you know, it's hard to make a final table in anything unless you're playing in your local poker room and there's only 20, 30 people in the field. It's hard to make final tables. So have fun, you know, enjoy it while you're there. But the main thing is to really be focused on what it is you're trying to accomplish. So if, if you are going to try to ladder up, then ladder up don't be calling raises with marginal hands to see if you can hit a flop because then you're going to bleed away chips too fast mm -hmm. um if you're gonna like if you only care about the win then play for the win and take chances and don't worry about getting knocked out early at the final table of course i'm going to try to play for maximum equity and that's what i teach my students because it's pretty hard to teach something else because like if all you care about is the trophy and first prize, mm -hmm. uh, then I would have to teach you very differently than the guy that like, oh man, each of these pay jumps is huge. I really want to make some pay jumps. Like I can't teach both of you at the same time, at least mm -hmm. with those different goals. The big mistake I see, you know, less experienced players make at final tables. And even earlier than that, when as soon as you start getting close to the money, is a lot of them are concerned about like either making the money and not bubbling or getting some pay jumps. But then they're like, if they see you at the table and let's say you're the big stack and you're being the bully and pushing them around, the big mistake they make is things like, well, I'm not going to let this guy bully me. I'm going to defend my big blind here with ace 10. And then when it comes queen 10, three, they call your C bet because they're like, well, I think my 10 is probably the best hand here. So they'll call once, they'll call twice, even the third time. But then when you fire off the huge bet on the river, they finally get scared and fold. That's the big mistake is like putting in a fairly sizable amount of chips and then folding when you still believe that you have the best hand. Mm, so yeah, they because get scared. Like, yeah, like I, I started this hand with 200,000 chips and I've, I've put in 50,000. And now you've bet enough to put me all in on the end. And I'm like giving up because I'm scared. And it's like, no, like if you still believe you're the winner, mm -hmm. you, you can't be folding in that spot. Because if you're going to fold in that spot when you still think you have the best hand, then you should have folded way back when. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you should have folded one of the earlier streets before you put 25% of your chips in the pot and then gave up. Now it'd be different, you know, you might be, you and I could be going over a hand history and you could say, I saw a tell, like I was pretty sure he was bluffing. And then his eyes lit up when the dealer put out the river card. So I folded because I thought he actually hit the river and I, and that he did have me beat. Mm -hmm. That's a very different scenario than 
I had no reason to think that that deuce on the river helped him. I still believe I had the best hand, but I didn't want to risk my tournament life. I'm like, if you didn't want to risk your tournament life, fold the ace 10 preflop instead of defending your blind with a hand that's going to make a marginal one pair hand. You know, like when you do hit the flop, it's going to be this one pair hand. Yeah. And I think there's lots of those spots in poker, right? Where you're just, you're in the moment and you're like, okay, I have the turn. I have to call, I have to call. And then you just like, you have to make those decisions. It's all about decision making. And like you said, yeah. removing that extra emotion, you were talking about tournament life before and saying how it's just not part of the equation. If it is part of the equation, that's okay. But to maybe recognize that and then do something different. Well, and be looking ahead. Like if you've seen this guy being the bully for quite a while, then it's like, well, if, if you just call him on the flop and you just call him on the turn, isn't he going to fire the river regardless? Because if you could have foreseen all of this as reasonably likely to happen, then why did you call call fold? Because <laughs> yeah. that would imply that you like only called hoping to improve on the turn of the river. And when you didn't make two pair or better, you finally gave up, which, like, well, that would be a horrible strategy. You should have folded on the flop if you're going to fold by the river if you don't hit a five outer. Um, but I think so a lot it's, of that, it's that happens, kind right? of a thing. A it does happen a lot with the, the amateur players because there's a lot of emotion driving. They're like, okay, this guy's being a bully and I'm sick of it. And ace 10 is ahead of his range. Well, like, well, maybe three bet him then mm. instead of just calling to defend your blind. But if you're going to just call to defend your blind, that means when you hit the flop, you probably need to decide not to give up. And if I'm playing the same hand the same way, the difference is I'm snap calling the river. And if he has my pair of tens beat, and fuck my right, life. Yep. I, I, <laughs> lose, I lose. I'm out. Bad read or whatever. Or maybe the deuce on the river did. Like, oh, shoot. The guy had seven deuce and he made two pair on the river. It's like, sucks to be me right now, but oh well. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's got to happen, right? But that'd be the whole reason I was just calling the whole time is that I was trying to induce more bluffs. It's kind of like, well, if I raise on the flop, he might just get away from his nothing hand or his bottom pair. Mm -hmm. And I want him to keep bluffing with those hands. Yeah, so, exactly. I, I mean, I had this discussion the other day. Uh, we, we were covering a commentary of a stream of a final table and it was quite short, quite short stacks. And people had aces, I think two hands in a row. And he had like nine blinds or 10 blinds. It was on a final table. Um, and he was in the big blind and just shoved against a guy who was opening like 70, 60% of his range. And it was like, you're never getting value from your aces in these, in some of these spots. And he did it the very next hand as well. And obviously, I mean, the guy raised seven too off. That's how wide he was raising. You know? So, I mean, yeah. you know. Well, I mean, it would also depend. I mean, if, you know, if, if you were opening for two and a half X and my whole stack is 15, like raising less than all in looks suspicious. Oh, I would just flat. I mean, I think at that you know, stack, yeah. you have to take a chance. I mean, you're a final yeah, table. You, you certainly, we, yeah, we can discuss the better way of playing the hand. But, you know, like I said, people get too risk averse. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also a common mistake amongst less experienced players is they are they're not sufficiently risk averse early in a tournament, especially if they can re-enter. Mm -hmm. But then they're way too risk averse late in the tournament. And and the whole thing, like, you know, um, Lon, or not Lon, but uh, Norm, you know, has always gone on about tournament life. He's risking his tournament life and all those World Series broadcasts. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and that's just like, yeah, I like, look at tournament life is a meaningless concept. If we're doing the math of the situation and it says this line that risks your whole stack is the most profitable line, then you take it. We've already presumably taken into account tournament life when we did the math. So you can't then add an extra layer to it, as we said before. And that's too many players who do that. So how do you train for this stuff, Greg? Like, obviously, you can just sit and play, but uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm guessing there needs to be some sort of training or study behind the scenes. Well, it's just a matter of accepting emotionally that uh, if this is the most high equity decision to make, that I don't care what comes with it. Like, I ignore risk. 
to me, that's just not a factor. It's equity. Every decision is equity. Which decision carries the highest equity? And and that's just something that a lot of players have a hard time with. Because but it, seemed, it seems very easy the, for you. Like, was it always that way? Did you always have an easy time, like just removing that aspect? Or was it something like in your early days you did tilt? Or was it just always this way? I'm just a very math oriented guy. And I'm not, you know, super emotional about stuff mm -hmm. as they happen. Like, especially things like this that, you know, I mean, if you and I are having a discussion and you make a comment, then maybe I can infer that you are implying something bad about me or, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, some kind of hidden insult. And, and that may or may not be true, but there's, that's not a math situation. When it comes to math and randomness, it's like, it's like screaming at the roulette ball or the wheel. Because, mm -hmm. you know, your, your number, it came up red instead of black. You're going to scream at the wheel and like, you know, lose your temper and throw the ball across the room. I'm like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little chunk of marble or whatever. Like it doesn't have any feelings. It doesn't care. It clearly had nothing against you. Mm -hmm. you know whereas if you and i are in a conversation and you say something that might be an insult i'm like like hey what the hell man chris like why are you uh why are you implying this negative crap about me like what did i do mm -hmm. so that would be different to give an emotional reaction to something like that because there might be emotions behind what you're saying but a card off the deck i mean i have never ever even come close to thinking like this dealer sucks because of yeah. the card they put on the table. Yeah. Like I literally, there is no recollection in my mind. If, if, if you're a dealer I've seen many times, I don't have the slightest clue in the world, whether you've dealt me more winners or losers, mm -hmm. whether you've given me more good or bad river cards than any other dealer. I haven't the faintest clue mm. which side of that equation you're on. Well, we're always trying I to just... find reasons for something, aren't we? We're always trying to find the reason behind yeah. things rather than just knowing that, like, no, <laughs> it's yes. just randomness. People, humans, humans are not good at accepting that some things are random. And and the, the more impact something has, any event, the more people think there has to be a reason for it. Um, you know, I had an interesting thing. You, you, you may be aware that, like, the assassin, assassination of John F. Kennedy you know, years ago that there's still people who have all these conspiracy theories and stuff that they go on about. And it was the Cubans, it was the mafia, it was the CIA, it was whatever. And someone, you know, made an interesting comment about that because he was saying how like, here's these conspiracy theories that have continued to attract followers decades after the event. And they're like, but look what happened to Ronald Reagan. Like he got shot by a would-be assassin he didn't die though. He recovered quite quickly. You know, it was like, oh, we're going to go to surgery and, you know, fix some stuff. But, you know, in the end, this is no big deal as a medical event for the president. Like, since he got to a hospital right away, there was no chance this was going to cause a long term impact. And there is no like huge set of conspiracy theories about this lone gunman mm -hmm. who shot Reagan. But the, the concept is that if Reagan had died, if he had succeeded in killing Reagan, we probably would have all these conspiracy theories about it wasn't just this one guy by himself who's insane and did something crazy. It was part of this big plot and coup attempt or, you know, it was the Russians, it was whoever. There would be all these conspiracy theories that would arise around it. Mm -hmm. But because the end result was not a big deal, it didn't give right because people don't people will accept the simple explanation when the impact of the event is fairly mild but when the impact of the event is huge like the president died mm -hmm. now people want there to be a big explanation and something significant not just like one guy's crazy mm -hmm. and and went off and did it so if if, if he had just hit kennedy but it had just been like, oh, you know, it's a flesh wound. It went through his shoulder and he's fine and nothing, you know, didn't break a bone or anything. We probably wouldn't have all these conspiracy theories about it. No, people have to find some other way to spend their time, find some other conspiracy theories. Yeah. But like I said, the, the bigger the event, like that's why COVID, it's such a huge thing. Yeah. In terms of its impact on the world, the people want an explanation. They don't want it to be random mutation in the wild. Mm-hmm with no real, they want it to be 
you know, it was released intentionally by yes. Chinese bio, bi, bio lab or whatever. They they want there to be a serious explanation with a lot of heft and weight to it, rather than it looks like it was just a random bad luck event that this virus popped up now and it could have happened 10 years sooner or 10 years later and whatever. So even if we had foolproof evidence that it was a random event in nature, people wouldn't want to accept that because it's had such a huge impact. But if it was like, oh, it was some other virus that people were scared of for a little bit, but it turned out in the end not to be that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. Now the public will just accept the random explanation that like, oh yeah, this randomly happened. But, you know, since it ended up not being such a big deal that they'll accept the simple explanation. Yeah. And you always remember the things, you know, that also do happen and not the things that don't happen. Like when you meet your neighbor uh, in the same holiday destination halfway across the world, you know, and you're like, oh my God, what are you doing here? But you don't remember all the times it didn't happen, (laughs) you know? So it seems like a freak event, but in actual fact, it's just normal statistics. I mean, you're just not thinking about it. No, there's a lot of selective memory to any of that stuff. And, And the human brain has evolved to find patterns. Because if you, when you know you, when you when you and I were hunter gatherers, our ancestors you know were hunter gatherers a hundred thousand years ago, and it's like okay, like where should we go hunt? Where should we go next for hunting? And you and I have remembered that like well, this one valley over here, about this time of year, there's always like a bunch of you know migrating animals that thunder through that valley. It's easy to kill some of them. Like, let's go try there again. Like, we've seen it twice. So let's go there. Well, you know, the fact that we remembered that pattern, and of course, two incidents is not a very reliable indicator of a pattern. But it's like, well, we have to pick somewhere to go. So let's pick better than zero. Yeah. So it's like, why would we pick some other valley the other direction if, if that one has some evidence to suggest it? So our brains have evolved to notice patterns. And we're always looking, well, we assume that every time we see a pattern, there's a reason. Because we're trying to figure out what's the reason for this pattern yeah, we've exactly. noticed. Because we can try to take advantage of it if, you know, even better if we understand it. And that's part of why people want there to be a reason, that random is not a reason. People want an explanation, something they can, you know, so if something bad happens, a president gets assassinated, a virus kills millions of people. They want an explanation that has an actual reason behind it rather than, well, it was just random bad luck. Yeah, it's it's not something that makes sense to a lot of people, but it is a, it's just a pure fact that that is the way the world works. Um, There's more, it's randomness can explain almost everything that happens to us. I mean, obviously like you make a decision, you know, you fold, you call, you raise, you know, that's not random. You've made a decision. But the cards that come after, you know, I mean, I see all the time in PLO, people are like, I'm done raising with aces. Like every time I raise with aces, all I do is build a pot, miss the flop and lose a lot of money. And it's like, you know, you're, you're taking your observations of a small number of examples, and then you're trying to determine your strategy. That's why learning from experience which was the only way people could do it way, way back 20 plus years ago in poker. Um, That's why the players who learned that way, even if they were the best at the time, they suck today unless they've evolved with the rest of us because the things they learned in the eighties and nineties and stuff based on just time at the table and playing, it's like, you can't remember things in enough detail to really figure out like, Oh, like, Is this a hand I'm better off raising with or limping in? Like, which way makes more money? Like, since every scenario is slightly different, by the time you've seen enough examples, do you remember them all accurately enough going way back when? But this is why there's so much money to be made in poker as well, because... You know, if there wasn't that element of randomness, it would just be like chess and you'd have a skill and you know who would, who was going to win. But the fact that you can actually get paid off and win by doing something incorrectly yes. is what makes the game so profitable because people yes. will attach winning to their incorrect mistakes and they'll just keep doing them. 
Yes, no, very much so. And, uh, and people do do random things, um, even if it doesn't seem random to them. I mean, one of my questions, when I see someone play like a, a really insanely stupid hand, like this was a hand that never should have put a penny into the pot. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of like, I'm not asking myself, you know, and I'm not even interested in asking them, why did you play that hand? Mm-hmm. As much as like, what were all those other hands you folded? Um, so the, the hand that has always stuck with me, I'm playing a, an HPT main event in Colorado and it's 15 levels on day one. And we're pretty late and like we're level 13. And uh, I've been at the same table for a while. And so is this guy. So we have a player who raises under the gun, under the gun plus one, three bets. Now the player in question is next to act. And he thinks very briefly a few seconds and calls. I'm sitting a few spots behind and I'm thinking like, what did he just call with? Because he just called off like over, like over 30% of his chips, <laughs> you know, like almost a third of his stack. He just called. Yeah. I'm like, nothing makes sense. You know, like if you're trying to trap with aces, you don't need to trap like this, you know, you can go all in and the guy who three bet is going to feel pot committed, you know? So I'm like, but I, now this is not a bad beat story. Cause I folded whatever crappy uh-huh. hand I had at the time. Everyone else folded. The guy who raised under the gun folded as well. So now the two guys are heads up and the flop comes queen, six, deuce, rainbow. Of course, our player who like, I'm thinking, why did you call? Um, only has a pot size bet left and it all goes in on the flop. Mm-hmm. And the three better has jacks. And it's like, okay, there's a queen out there. But if you're going to have an overcard, you figure that's the best one. Mm-hmm. So I'm probably not going to be like, and certainly I'm not check folding jacks, you know, for no, a pot size pot bet all in. Also, no. Yeah. So, uh, so he has jacks and, and the guy who called has queen five off suit and, and he wins and doubles up. And, and again, like in my mind, I'm not like, why did you call here with queen five, which is super horrible, yeah. but I'm thinking like, Hey, we've been at this table for a while. You're folding over half your hands pre flop. Yeah, yeah. He got bored. What were all the, what were those <laughs> hands you folded? like that's really what my question is like is is queen five for some silly reason your lucky hand yeah yeah was this like i just had a hunch like as the dealer was shuffling i, was, I think i'm due to yeah win exactly he's not thinking in 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 that's the thing like you're projecting your way of thinking onto him and he's not thinking anything like that he's probably yeah. just thinking it's dinner time or it's the end of the day i don't want to come to day two let's just call and see what happens if if i make it i make hey. it like <laughs> You don't know I, what's yeah, I have on. no idea. I have no idea what's in his mind. And I'm I'm curious. I mean, it doesn't really matter in any strict sense. I mean, yeah, if I could figure all this out, I'd be able to play against him more successfully for the next couple hours that's left, um, you know, hour and a half or so that's left in the day. But I am genuinely curious, like even if they were about to break our table, if there was some way I could ask this guy, and know that it wouldn't be taken as an insult. I'd be like, you know, I'm curious, like what, why did you choose to play the queen five? And and now if it's just someone who just never folds, it's like, okay, no curiosity. You don't fold and you didn't fold queen five. It all fits. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean it's a sensible, smart way to play, obviously, but it's like, it all makes sense. You know, it's a coherent strategy, even though it's a bad one. Uh Uh-huh. Here, though, I'm like, you know, because like the very next hand, the guy he just beat is under the gun and folds. He looks at his cards and immediately folds. And in my mind, I'm just, I want to scream out loud, like, what the hell did you just fold? Like, for one big blind, what did you, I mean, it couldn't be worse than queen five. Like, it, it seems like you need to figure things out, Greg. Like, you like to figure things out. Otherwise, it rattles on your brain a little bit. Well, I'm just curious about it. But that's, to me, the real question. It's not so much, why did you play queen five? But like, why yeah, did you play this queen this... five if you're if you're folding all these other hands? Yeah. Because if you think of that very next hand where he no one had acted yet, if he limped in and you were like, which decision is better? You know, Chris, his limp for one blind with whatever that is, or his call with queen five, you would say this is less bad. Uh-huh. 
Like the queen five is a worse play. If he min raised with whatever two cards, you would still say the queen five was a worse play. If he shoved with <laughs> these two cards, no matter what they were, you would still say, well, there's that's a stupid shove, but there's such a great chance that no one calls that it's still not as bad as you calling a third of your chips with queen five. So like any decision he made to play that next hand mm. would have been from your point of view or my point of view, not as bad as his call no, no, with the queen five. Completely agree. But like we said, uh, he, he's just not thinking in these terms. He obviously something random. No, 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 <laughs> he, he isn't. But I'm just saying that's to me, the curiosity part is like, what is it? Was it just this hunch? Cause when I used to play blackjack, you'd see that like, here's someone who maybe they know, that like, oh, I have a 12 and the dealer is showing a five. I'm supposed to stand. Mm -hmm. But then they would just like, eh, I have a hunch. The next card's a small card. I'm going to take a hit, mm. you know, and it's like, so it's just this hunch, whatever that means. And uh -huh. so I would see that. And it's like, this person knows that that's technically the, a, a bad play, mm -hmm. but they'd still do it um, at least some of the time. So it's like, okay, what made this hunch come out on this occasion, but not like when the same scenario presented itself five hands ago, you stood pat then you didn't even seem to think about it. Like, oh yeah, dealer has a five, I'm, I'm standing. So why the difference? Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, it's something to be curious about, but not, it's not like I'm losing sleep over these things. No, no, no. But you must have played surely and been in some hands where there was something intuitive in your brain that maybe goes against your logic or, or is saying to you to do one thing in an instant and then yes. you, know, you try and rationale around it. I mean, it must happen. You've played for so long that you're just going to have a really good intuitive no, sense. I, of I, I get these feelings all the time and, and I ignore them because I found that like they, my feelings don't mean crap. Okay. Um, like, you know, like I'll get that feeling that like the dealers shuffling or just starting to pitch cards. And I'm like, man, I think I'm going to win a big pot. Hmm. And then I look down at seven deuce and I fold and it's not like, oh shit, I would have hit the flop. Mm. I mean, sure. Sometimes I do. It's like, oh, I would have hit, but I don't find that I, in those scenarios where I had some feeling, mm. you know, it's different if I have a feeling about you, mm. if you raise and I feel like you're weak mm. or strong, that's different because yeah, now exactly. that could be. Even if I can't explain why, exactly, it could be this kind of subconscious read mm -hmm. of your body language that I'm not even consciously aware of why it is, but yep. you feel strong or you feel weak to me. Mm -hmm. That's I'm not. I'm only thinking about like some feeling about what cards are coming. Like I feel I'm going to make this flush. No, no, no. Those um, feelings... I was relating it to actual, you know, playing against someone, having that intuitive, like you know, you can yeah. read something or. No, yes. not cards coming out obviously um yeah yeah no, and that, that part yes i agree with you sometimes you just feel like this guy's full of shit and and i'm going to calm him down even though my hand's really weak mm. um you know or at least on relative terms for this situation it's a very weak hand mm -hmm. and i've made those call downs and and sometimes i'm right sometimes i'm wrong but i'm probably you know well ahead yeah lifetime with those situations I'm only thinking of those people who are, you know, like they feel like this hand's going to hit yeah, or yeah. like, Oh, five. This is a, obviously not what? relevant. <laughs> yeah. Someone else. Cause I would never ask them this. Cause I know it, it's kind of insulting, but like someone plays a hand like eight, five mm -hmm. and they win and their opponents like, how could you call my raise with that hand? They're like, well, fives have been hot. There's been a five on almost every flop. And, and, and I can tell they're serious. And I'm thinking like, are, are you mentally, uh, you know, handicapped. I mean, like you think because fives have been coming out on the flop a lot that that means there's more. You you honestly think that is an indication that we're more likely to see a five on this flop? Yeah, yeah. It's just a lack of understanding, isn't it? It's just a lack of of the maths concepts in terms of what's going on. Well, it, it's that, but I think it's again, it's that human evolutionary thing that we notice patterns. So I will notice that, like, oh, there's been a lot of fives on the flop. But then I'm immediately aware that like that doesn't mean anything 
it's a pattern, but it's irrelevant. Yeah, exactly. It's but, like the roulette wheel, isn't it? Seven blacks come yes. in a row, and, this, and someone thinks it'll be red. Exactly. And, you know, it's the same. It's the same thing. Oh yeah, I've seen that scene more than once in Vegas. I'm walking through the casino, and two people, like a couple or a couple of mates, are sitting there at the roulette table, and you see on that tote board, like, oh, like it said, it's been black seven times in a row, and they're arguing stridently with one another because one of them's like we got to bet black black is hot and the other one's like you're an idiot we got to bet red red is due <laughs> and and i just chuckled to myself because like like these two idiots think one of them's right <laughs> yeah it's, it's just like, lack of understanding is it just lack of understanding of maths and and you know we're we've all got our strengths i guess <laughs> so well, it's, it's not, i don't even know if it's lack of understanding but it's just in the moment emotionally you don't go to that logical side of your brain to think about it because again there's this thing hardwired into our brains from evolution that if we detect a pattern we ascribe meaning to it mm -hmm. even if like even if we don't know what the meaning is we think there's something to it as soon as we see a pattern and and there just isn't because like if you write down those results of that roulette wheel or if you write down every card that's been on the board in a, in a hold'em game and you go back and you look at it for all these thousands of hands or thousands of spins you're like you're going to find all these patterns and they don't mean a thing none of them mean anything about like what's coming next on that wheel or on that flop mm -hmm. so but our brains our evolution you know of of human nature we want to think that patterns have meaning yeah for sure and i mean it must have must have helped us uh, somewhere just not on the roulette table or, or in, the, in the poker room so we'll we'll do a rapid fire fun questions now greg uh, i'll just spin right. up some questions i'm gonna i'm gonna try to like be fast <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not good at like because i'm always like well, i want to think about it at least for a second or two yeah the poker brain i'm, I'm similar in that respect okay your favorite poker player don't have one just i like people who are nice and fun to play with whether they're i'd rather have a bunch of fish at my table but you know <laughs> preferably friendly fish but i don't have like a favorite in that sense fair enough live or online oh i definitely do better live okay what's your favorite event that used to be an easy question, but I'm getting so annoyed with the World Series. Oh, really? That like, like there's just too many things. I don't like the way they're doing some of the stuff. So at this point, I would say, again, I'm kind of indifferent on that. Um, it used to be easy, a main event. But again, I'm just I'm not happy with the way the World Series is handling some of the things lately. Like the, the main event payouts this year were, again, a shit show mm -hmm. of, you know, it was like a 400 and some thousand dollar jump from 10th to 9th and then you go from 9th to 8th and it's like a hundred thousand dollar jump like that's just stupid and that's because they like oh we want to say that everyone who made the final table is a millionaire yeah so now we've artificially inflated ninth prize and now that means 10th 11th 12th those guys all got underpaid um so that kind of stuff pisses me off like you're gonna like screw with our money because you think it has some marketing benefit for you. And then that kind of decision making pisses me off. But you the think lighting the marketing... was pretty horrible. Mm -hmm. But do you think the marketing in that aspect could actually help the event long term, even if it does affect those few spots? Not anymore. No. You might have been able to persuade me of that at the beginning of the poker boom. Mm. But, you know, yes, amateurs come play the main event, but. I don't think any of them are like, I'm more likely to play because if I make the final table, I'm going to get at least a million. Mm. It's like, they know, even the amateurs know like, Hey, it's six, 7,000 people, 8,000 people going to enter this thing. Chances of my making the final table are slim, no matter how good I am. Mm -hmm. So that I don't think that has a real impact. I think the thing that they did, which has had an impact. And I think is it was a good decision was, paying 15% instead of 10% that they switched to several years ago. I think that's beneficial in many respects because the guy who comes and makes the money in any of the, maybe yeah. they show up and they're not even going to play the main event. They're going to play those 600, 800, thousand dollar buy-ins. 
and they make the money, they get a min cash. Mm. Even if they it's lost huge. money, because like, like oh, I, I I entered this thing twice for sixteen hundred, and I min cashed for twelve hundred. That still, they walk away with a happy feeling, and they're on Twitter and Facebook, like with my payout ticket and stuff. Yeah. So I think paying them, you know, fifteen percent was a was a great decision. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the rake is so high in all the events and. And then some of the, the service just is substandard for that. So I'm, you know, there's always been things to complain about and there always will be. And in some cases, you know, it's, it's a personal preference. So, you know, we might, if I'm complaining to you about the structure of an event, maybe you'll feel the opposite. Yeah. Like, no, Greg, I wish that structure was even faster, you know, or if I'm saying it should be faster and you're like, no, 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 you want it slower. Like that's just personal opinion, but things like messing with payouts, like the Brasilia room this year, the lighting was so crappy. You could hardly see. Yeah. That's not fun. I mean, like the way I normally look at my whole cards, I'd be like, I can't do it because it's too dark. I can't see yeah, them. I'd have to like open it up a lot more, open yeah. my hands up a lot more to, to actually let more light in mm. so I could read my cards. And I'm just like, this is ridiculous. Like we're paying all this rake put better light bulbs in the damn future. <laughs> whatever has caused this problem i mean it's when it's moving yeah, next you, year right it's changing locations yeah. so maybe they will fix that well that specific issue might be vastly improved we don't know but it's just the fact that like you're still making these mistakes mm -hmm. when you've been there since 05. yeah you would um, you would expect things to be pretty tight by now you know all right, let's get on, on that end. Let's get on with the rest of rest of the questions. What do you love the most about poker? Winning. <laughs> it's it's it, working it, like a true champ. <laughs> it, it feels good to win. I mean, I used to play racquetball competitively, like in high school and college, and I was like a top ranked amateur player at the time, uh, despite my build. At the time, I was a really good racquetball player, and and it's it's you know winning feels good. It, that just, is it always felt it always felt better to win no matter what what are you best at in poker i don't think i have any like areas where i'm seriously weak okay certainly i in cash games what i really love are mixed games mm -hmm. you know, like limit mixed games and i used to play a lot of the very high stakes games like a bellagio and stuff so we're playing 300 600 400 800 mix and you're playing six different games let's say i never really ever felt like wow of these eight people i am the best at omaha high low or i'm the best at triple draw but i almost always felt like i was probably second or third in every game That's and what close. i would find is that like okay like you're definitely better than me at triple draw and badoogie mm -hmm. but it's like but you're really bad at the stud games so, so even though fold. you're gonna <laughs> Well, I'm just saying, like that, that they wouldn't just fold, and and so it was kind of like, even if if this were a triple draw game, I wouldn't want to play with you, like you're better than me. So if it was you and a bunch of other people like you, I wouldn't want to play at all. But because this mixed game, even if I'm not the best player or the you know second best player, but because I was never in the bottom half mm -hmm. of any of the games. So in other words, it's like I was pretty good at all the games. Yeah, and I think I think, I think I think I could say that too about like no limit that when we look at the different aspects of the game that I don't have any like serious flaws. Mm -hmm. Certainly I can improve, I have room to improve at everything. But I don't think I have like a systemic error that mm -hmm. really hurts me badly at any one aspect of the game. Fair enough. What's the best thing about being a poker player? Um, you get to set your own schedule. What's the worst thing? it's you have to win i mean what other job do you like go work all day and you have less money at the end of the day even if you're a salesman working only on commission like on your bad days you you make nothing hmm. but you don't like go out try to sell all day fail and you're like now you're a thousand dollars in the hole yeah yeah that's the tough part um if poker disappeared tomorrow what would you do I'd probably go back to being a patent lawyer What's the best book you've read lately? Fossil Man's Winning Tournament Strategies. <laughs> of course. You know, of course. <laughs> if I exclude my own book, um, I'm uh, currently in the middle of uh, 
um, Dylan Lynn's mastering mix games. Mm -hmm. So that's had some good stuff. Okay, nice. Uh, favorite movie? Probably the Lord of the Rings movies. Mm, favorite place in the world? Home. I've lived 12 places, but wherever it is at the time, home is probably the best. But if I have to travel, it's going to be places with lots of great history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's going to be places like, like London and, and Paris and stuff like that. Or if I ever get there, maybe places like the, the pyramids in Egypt or mm. some of that kind of stuff. Okay, nice. Tell us something most people don't know about you. I already mentioned it. Like I was like one of the top ranked amateur racquetball players <laughs> way back, way back when in the, uh, like, you know, around 1980 period of time. Um, yeah. Cause people, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big guy. So people assume that I was never athletic, mm -hmm. but even though I was still a big guy back then, wasn't really, it's funny. I was considered the fat guy in high school and I look at old pictures and I'm like, how was I the fat kid? Like I wasn't fat at all. I just wasn't like real skinny like uh -huh. so many of them were like they were super thin yeah. whereas i or i already had like substantial legs and arms and stuff but i'm like but i wasn't fat yeah like it wasn't like i had a, a belly or anything back then but somehow i was considered the fat kid um and yet i could still you know i was on the soccer team the tennis team you know one of the i mean for my age probably the best racquetball player in yeah. the state that's not bad for sure <laughs> That's just... so it's like i could go play racquetball for eight hours a day like mm -hmm. easy back then i couldn't run a lap though man I, I could but i hated it like i could sit there on the court do high intensity drills training and working on my game and do it for an hour straight but then you asked me to go run a lap and it's like i've gone 20 yards and i'm just like oh my god please this is so boring let me <laughs> do i have to do this you know just just i hate exercise but if you make it a game now i could mm, yeah yeah it's i could do, i could i could yeah i could just do it non-stop and so i was in much better athlete a much better physical condition back then and people just assume otherwise i used to try to get prop bets uh on racquetball like when i was an attorney and i was now yeah. much bigger much chubbier you know basically my current size and if you had some young athletic kid, they just like, how could this fat old man, you know, of course, I mean, we're talking like I'm 38, you know, but when you're 20 years old, that seems like an old man. And, uh, you know, I was never able to get much of a hustle there, but you tried at least. <laughs> sure. Like we would try, like when I lived in Connecticut, I was, I was working for Pfizer when I won the main event and I was at their facility in Southeast Connecticut, which is near Foxwoods. And they had two big tournament series a year. And a lot of the big name players would show up for their world poker finals. And I remember having a friend who was in a cash game with Huck Seed. And he was going to try to like kind of talk Huck into prop betting me at racquetball. Unfortunately, Huck had never played the game ever. So <laughs> couldn't, couldn't be talked into it. But if he had played, yeah. and, he's a, and he's a great athlete, you know, super fit, super fast, you know, he certainly could have just said, how could this fat old man beat me? Mm -hmm. You know, like I've played racquetball. I'm pretty, you know, cause it's one of those things too, where if you haven't played someone who's a lot better, you don't realize how bad you are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so at that time, if, if he had played a lot with his buddies, like unless he had seriously like competed at the sport, mm. like entered tournaments and stuff, he might have thought like just based on athletic ability alone, there's no way this guy can beat me. And he would have been drawing stone cold dead. You know, it'd be like if you were a good amateur tennis player, like even if you played in the league and stuff, and then you'd see this old man and you would think, of course, I can beat that old man. And it turned yeah, out yeah. like, oh, no, no, he was he was like a tour pro for 20 years and he still plays five times a week and you'd be drawn dead. He'd like yeah, hit the first sure. serve and, and you wouldn't touch it. And you'd be like, oh, shit, because you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like he would just hit these shots that even if you were faster than him and had more reach and everything else, it'd just be like he would hit shots that you just couldn't touch. Yeah. 
and you wouldn't be able to hit it by him just because he would I mean, I was always called like sneaky fast. People are like, how are you, you know, like, you, yeah. don't, you don't seem to run fast, but you always get the get shot. That. I'm like, <laughs> but that was because I was good at reading people. Like you would be hitting the shot and you would just like, just be starting your downswing. And I'd be like, oh, he's hitting it to the left side. Yeah. And I'd be moving there before you've even touched the ball. And then you would hit the shot. You'd think it's a winner. And then I'd be right there, bam. And you'd be like, how did you get to that? That was such a great shot. And I'm like, if I had been standing here and had to wait until you hit it, yeah, I wouldn't have, have, I would not have gotten there. And of course that's those bad reads. I've done that where I'm all the way over here on the left wall. And when I was wrong and you hit it down the right side, you know, and you're looking over and you're like, what are you doing over there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you're like picking up the ball to go serve the next point because you just won. So it was, you know, you, you make some big mistakes, but in bulk, you come out ahead with those reads. Seems like no matter what the game, competition and reads are, are getting you there. What's what's your best life moment? I, I got to say winning the main event. You're supposed to say when you got married, when your kid was born. And, and I get that. And it's not like those weren't huge moments. But when and, and people are talking to some like great, you know, you're talking to Michael Jordan or something, and it's like he's supposed to say that and he knows he's supposed to say that because he'll come across as like a jerk if he doesn't. But I'm like, come on, like, yeah, almost everyone, most people get married, most people have kids, you know, this is a great moment, but it's not something that's special and unique that kind of distinguishes you from everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so I still have to say something like that, you know, was a bigger deal. And, and finally, what's next for you, Greg? I'll continue as I am for now. I, I do my live seminars, which of course haven't happened for a long time because of COVID, um, which is why I do a lot more of like private lessons on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm going to go finish packing now when we're done and, and drive over to uh, Cherokee and play this event. Over the weekend, they got their circuit main event, and I'm going to be flying to Houston after that for another tournament series, and I'll be doing more of that next year. I still love playing. I still like winning, and I can't sit here at home and win those tournaments, so I'll travel around, play events. You know, I've got my second book will be coming out when I can get off my ass and finish it. Nice. Where can people and get the first one? Anywhere you can buy a poker book, it, you know, like DNB Publishing is the publishing company, and you can go to their website um, and pick it up. But it's going to be on Amazon. It it may be in a retail bookstore, you know, brick and mortar store. I don't know. I mean, good chance it isn't, but it might. And if it isn't, you can go to the website for that, you know, retail store and probably buy it that way. Mm -hmm. Um. But then the next book will come out and hopefully I'll be able to start booking some seminars now that COVID's becoming less of an issue and uh, just keep on going. I can, if I get sick of it, I'm, I'm actually doing some patent work on the side now. Mm -hmm. I have a case right here sitting right in front of me. I, I would need to get to in the next few days. Um, a patent attorney out of uh, Pennsylvania got me doing some work for him and uh, cause he's been so busy. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's kind of fun. You know, I, I didn't quit my job because I hated my job. You know, it's like, this is a, I mean, you're a patent attorney, you come to me as a client and it's like, either we're done right away. Cause I'm telling you like, no, you didn't really invent anything. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's old news. You may have invented it, but you've reproduced what someone else did years ago. Or more often, you know, you work in that field, you know what's new. It is an invention. But that means I'm working with you on something brand new. So here's this technology, and it's brand new by definition. If it isn't, you can't get a patent for it. So it's always new. It's always interesting. You know, my area of expertise was uh, chemistry, but more, more so biotechnology. And so, you know, lots of cool stuff always happening in those areas. Mm hmm yeah, for and, sure. Uh, so I, I enjoyed it. But, you know, after I won the main event, like Poker Stars was offering me more money to travel around the world and play poker and represent them than 
Pfizer was offering me to stay there and be a patent lawyer. Mm -hmm. So it was a pretty easy decision, like, you know, make a lot more money and travel around playing poker. Yeah, or, it seems like an easy decision. You know, if, if, however, if I had finished second, third, fourth, and such an offer was not available, mm -hmm. then I would have still been, I would have followed that advice I give people. I wouldn't have quit my job. Or if I did, I might have quit and started a solo practice. Mm -hmm. Like I'll work out of my home and, you know, I have this money cushion now. I'll take some time, get some clients. But I'll still be a patent attorney working from home instead of working as an employee for Pfizer, because then I can set my own schedule a little better. But I still would have been a full time patent attorney. And maybe if I wanted more poker than was available right there at Foxwoods, then I could have said, OK, let's move, you know, to Vegas. Let's move somewhere that has more poker options and I can still work as a full time lawyer setting my own schedule, but now I can make sure that like, okay, clients, like it's summertime, I'm going to be busy for the next month and a half. Mm -hmm. So I'm not taking new cases uh, that would overlap that time period. Yeah, fair enough. Well, you have your plates full, Greg. We certainly wish you the best of luck in the upcoming tournament. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute pleasure to meet you and speak with you. And uh, your thanks, words Chris. were timeless. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Russell, man. Cheers. My pleasure, mate. Have a good one. Take care.